All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this hearing of the Budget and Finance Committee. Uh, today is Monday, June 3rd, 2013. Uh, I'm Paul Krikorian, Chair of the Committee. I'm joined by uh, the Honorable Paul Kretz and the Honorable Mitchell Englander. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. Um, we're going to be taking uh, public comment prior to the agenda items today. Then we'll be uh, proceeding into closed session. Uh, and uh, then we'll come back for uh, the remainder of our discussion. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, general public comment. And at the moment, I have no general public comment cards. So we'll go ahead and close general public comment. Uh, and then we'll take any public comment on any of the closed session items. I have no cards on any of the closed session items. And seeing no hands being raised, uh, public comment on the closed session items, uh, items 1, 2, 3, and 4, uh, is now closed as well. Um, so why don't we go ahead, then we'll re retire to closed session in the back to consider items 1 through 4, and we'll be back presently. Thank you very much. Do we, uh, Mr. Seha, do we need to report anything out from closed session? No. Okay. Very good. Um, members, uh, items 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 are all matters that uh, unless you have any concerns or questions about, I would propose as being uh, potential consent uh, candidates. Again, that's 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. 11 through 15 being uh, Office of Finance reports relative to refunds. Item 10 is uh, an achievement. Item 8, the CAO's report about uh, the fourth construction projects report, and item 7. Uh, the report relative to year-end reserve fund borrowing, and the reason for that is we'll be dealing with that in the FSR in any event. So, um, if those are all good, yeah. uh, so all right, then very good. With uh, without objections, items seven, eight, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen uh, will be approved on consent, and that brings us to item number five, uh, and. Will be pre and thank you for those who uh, are leaving who were here on those matters. I should have said at the outset, I apologize for the late start, but Mr. Kretz and I were both uh, in EERC, so uh, I apologize for getting started a little bit late. Thank you for your patience. That brings us to item number five. I have two cards so far on item number five, which we'll hear uh, first, and those would be uh, Jim McQuiston followed by Elsa Moy. So, Mr. McQuiston? To start us off. Yeah. Jim McQuiston, <clears throat> you have my statement on this. I've gone into a little bit of detail on the reasons why we should do this, but I wanted to give you another reason too, and that is when the notices go out to repair your sidewalks, the people do them themselves, so the city is not necessarily involved, and we get a lot of cleanup immediately, whereas we don't get it otherwise. And when you have a good-looking sidewalk, people don't throw trash around either. So what it means is it beautifies the city as well as relieving a lot of our economic woes. So it's something that we really have to get back to. Uh, people. Uh, you know, I, I can remember when we had to fix our sidewalks, and uh, usually there was a contractor that came around right after the notice and said, I can do the sidewalk, and it got done right away. And that is really what we want to do, is get the Los Angeles looking really spiffy and uh, relieving street services from a lot of stuff which they cannot do very economically. We really need them on the streets. We don't need them fixing potholes and sidewalks. Right. Thank you. 
Uh, our next speaker is Elsa Moy. Is Ms. Moy still here? Ms. Moy. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Elsa Moy, I feel very potential. I'm VP Center Police. Um, it's on number five um, on the uh, budget uh, for the 2012-2013 general fund revised budget. Um, the change should be um, at 89 million 200,000 instead of 100,000. And the discrepancies on the grant receipts, it should be 2 million 400,000, not 500,000. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, uh, members on the FSR, um, what we have traditionally done in order to help people to get back to work is gone through this and, and just called departments special. Um, so would it be your pleasure to hear the introductory report uh, first, or would, should we just go ahead and start in by calling department special now so that everybody who isn't called can be relieved? That's fine. I would prefer to, to do the latter. So why don't we go sure. just go ahead and um, starting on uh, so starting on page uh, eight we can just go through the recommendations and any uh, departments that any member would like to call special go ahead and if we don't then they can be relieved starting with aging no nope. oh you want to call, go through each one or just well, I want to just see if anybody wants to call any of these special, and if not, we'll just let them go. I think they're all special. They're, they're special in their own way. Everyone is special <laughs> in their own way. I don't have anything I'm planning to call special. Mr. Kress has nothing. Have. All right. Way to go, Mr. Kress. Fire and street services. Okay. Very good. Well, then, everybody who's here on uh, any department other than fire department and street services, Thank you for coming. We I'm consider you very special, but, um, I'm assuming but we won't be asking any questions of you today. I'm assuming the CAO is going to stay. Yeah, the, the CAO is going to stay, yeah. I thought you were going to read off all this. Warm in here. <laughs> All right. So, actually, item number five, Mr. Seha. Item number five is a city administrative officer report relative to the year end or third financial status report for the fiscal year 2012 13. Would you like an introduction? <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm hoping for something. So, uh, the, the first sentence of the report is positively Dickensian. So I was <laughs> hoping to get, uh, you know, some, a dramatic interpretation maybe of that. Ben? <laughs> well, interpretive dance aside, I think we could say that. Uh, uh, it really has been a, a tale of two halves, as we state in this report, with respect to the discussions we were having, you know, in December 2012, with regard to the 2000, I mean, 209 positions and their potential uh, uh, expiration, and where we stand now as we are closing out the fiscal year. So um, Emily Mieta from our staff has uh, the details on on how the balances um, add up, really, between our expenditures for the year end and our revenues. Uh, but it is, as stated here, uh, a much stronger finish than we, we even could have expected at the start of the fiscal year. Very good. Ms. Okay. Maeda, welcome. Emily Maeda, Office of CAO. Uh, before I begin, there are three additional recommendations. I believe they were distributed to you. They're related to reappropriating money for fire. The first is reappropriating 500000 from the UB for the fire third-party review. The second is reappropriating 34000 for a remote automated weather station in Porter Ranch. And the third is 
25000 for uh, equipment for fire stations in CD7. So that's money that could not be spent by the end of the year that will be reappropriated to 1314. Do I have? Do we have copies of that? Uh, that's I don't I don't yet. No. Mr. Hale is about to pass them out. I think. Just have the one. No. This one. Yeah. You have. This one. Okay. Okay. Uh, so in the mid-year, the projected deficit was $9.6 million. It's now $4.28 million, and that consists of $3.8 million shortfall in the fire department and then $483,000 shortfall in the traffic safety fund. Uh, the deficits will be eliminated in this report. Uh, there are $84 million in recommendations, including transfers to implement the 39th program year consolidated plan, reauthorizing $9.8 million in MICLA funds, prior year MICLA funds to purchase replacement vehicles, $5.6 million in reappropriations for street services, and authorization for the controller to address street services 2011-12 reversion worksheet to, reflect, to accurately reflect expenditures this will result in an $8.5 million reserve fund loan to street services. The current reserve fund balance is $241.9 million, which is 5.32% of the adopted general fund budget. This is $12.7 million higher than reported in the mid-year. And I'm available if you have any questions. Okay, members. Mr. Englander. Um, on these, just reading the updates that were passed out. So, you know, while you're getting queued up on that, I just have a couple of, I mean, truly questions of things that I just didn't understand. Um, on recommendation number twenty-four, on. Uh, uh, this two and a half million dollar police appropriation. Um, it just caught my eye because um, it was uh, to a new account entitled grant reimbursement to the general fund. What, what was the, do you know what the nature of that is? One second. And I'm sorry, I already oh. let police go. <laughs> the police department has already gone. Uh, no, I can get some more information about okay, that for you. Thanks. We'll come back to that. That's fine. Um, I have a question on fire. I can let you go first on that, Mitch. Okay. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, well, first, since we're on that page, um, on number 24, I'll just jump up to 23, and if we could add... Uh, to neighborhood councils, um, Chatsworth Neighborhood Council has been uh, negotiating a lease for the past <laughs> almost two years, but it was supposed to be done this year for uh, a space on city property. Um, I don't recall the exact, it's almost done, but I don't recall the exact dollar amount. So a, a, a dollar <coughs> amount to be determined. We could find out what that is. Um, that they be approved to roll over that amount, not to exceed that amount. That will cover the following fiscal year so they're not penalized for the city's um, inability to get the lease done. It, so it, you're the, saying that they've, they've, they've not said, already encumbered it because the lease hasn't been in There was nothing to encumber it to. They'd set aside the funds with the idea of not spending it, and now they're going to lose it, but it's going to come out of their next year's budget. Just simply because the city attorney's office couldn't get the lease done isn't isn't right. So it's a rare situation, but um, that should qualify as an encumbrance, I think, anyway. The, as long yeah, as it's provided for it, in their minutes. It should. So we should be able to spell that out. So I'll get you the dollar amount. But let's. That was uh, an item. Yeah, that should have been an item. I'm sorry. I guess 22, or whatever it was. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we can. I'll work with your staff to get the amount. Work on that and just make a note of that as well. And then um, in terms of 
fire department. Um, not sure who we have here from fire and just talking about medical reimbursements and also where we're at on um, ambulance billing. Chief. And then also on the um, where we're at in terms of the status on the schedule where we identified cost savings for the schedule staffing changes for dispatch. And here we are at the final year end and I'm not sure if it was ever where we're at in, uh, in that transaction. Hello. Hello, June Gibson with the fire department. I think what the council member is referring to were the three items that the fire department was asked to report on a regular basis on. Um, with respect uh, to the deficit, as you may recall, the fire department began the fiscal year with a $10 million deficit. As the CAO is reporting, our deficit has now been reduced uh, to $3.8 million. And the reason for the uh, continuing deficit is because of the inability to complete negotiations for the conversion of the dispatch center from uh, platoon duty to a 40-hour schedule. So um, we're not anticipating that negotiations for that are going to be completed uh, anytime soon. And yeah. for that reason, we anticipate the beginning of next fiscal year, we're going to start with a deficit of $4 million uh, because of the inability to complete negotiations. Um, on the issue of um, AB 678, um, which was the item that was of particular concern uh, to the committee, um, it's our understanding that there was a meeting between the state uh, and the Center for Medicare Services last week. Uh, we've been trying to get specific details of the outcome of that meeting, uh, but our understanding is that um, CMS has made a decision with respect to the cost report. Um, we haven't yet seen what that final cost report uh, looks like, uh, but the preliminary information that we have received is that CMS has decided to bifurcate um, reimbursement for the transports and what we had referred to as fire suppression. And fire suppression uh, is we were seeking reimbursement for the um, engine company who is first on scene. And um, CMS has decided uh, that the reimbursement would not be forthcoming for that immediately. Um, we're unclear at this point as to whether CMS is going to require that a new supplemental um, plan amendment be processed uh, through the state legislature. Um, if that is the case, um, then we're going to be working uh, with um, State Senator Daryl Steinberg uh, to get that um, legislation introduced. Um, but the bifurcation of the transport from the fire suppression means that the projected $23 million that was included in the budget will be reduced to approximately $15 million, and that's our best um, estimate at this time um, without having seen what the actual cost report looks like. On an ongoing basis, we were uh, anticipating that the revenues received would be approximately $10 million. Um, absent the fire suppression component, the reimbursement will be reduced to about $6 million. That said, um, if the new supplemental plan um, amendment is going to be processed, then the retroactive reimbursement for the fire suppression component can be retroactive to July uh, 1st of 2011. Uh, so we're not anticipating that, you know, it's a, it's a total loss, um, but certainly for next fiscal year, uh, that um, reimbursement component is not going to be forthcoming. Hmm. Um, for the current fiscal year? You're, you're for, the, for the, right, I'm sorry, for, for the current fiscal year, but um, the legislation will have to be enacted for the, the current uh, legislative session, and so if we can get that completed by the end of the calendar year, then the amount will be retroactive to, to July of 2011. Yes, you're correct, okay. Councilman. Very good. And the, um, what, it, it, the report also <coughs> mentions the lower reimbursements from proprietary departments. What, do we, what, what was that in reference to? We're still working out the details um, with Water and Power um, on their comfort level uh, with respect to the formula and the specific incidents that are eligible for reimbursement. Um, what they had agreed to was a reimbursement of up to $2 million uh, from the fire side. Uh, that was based on um, very, very, very raw data from the CAD uh, on the number of incidents that the fire department uh, responded to. 
Um, we've had an opportunity to start drilling down into the specific details uh, of those incidents. Um, it's not likely that we're going to get reimbursed uh, for, uh, for $2 million. We're really not quite sure what that actual amount is going to be. Um, but we're still working with the city attorney in, in, in uh, Water and Power, and we're still working with the assistant um, chief financial officer of Water and Power um, to get that resolved. Okay. But the department um, signals a receipts below seven seven point four million below budget because of lower than expected productivity gains in ambulance service and lower reimbursements from proprietary departments. But those re hopeful reimbursements from proprietary departments weren't agreements that have been in existence. Those are new um, suggestions that are being flushed out. Is that? Uh, no. Um, what, that, what that is indicating uh, is that we are eligible to get reimbursed um, for a formula that includes the cap rate. Um, and the cap rate um, 34, which is the most recent one, uh, based on the controller's uh, calculation, is lower than cap 33, which is for the, for the previous fiscal year. So that's, that is what the CAO's report um, is making reference to. Okay, I guess I'm just – have we been billing those in the past, though? Have we been – have we gotten – has the fire department got reimbursed? Is there a history of that um, from proprietary departments or specifically what you're referring to from DWP? Has that occurred? Uh, no, not for water and power. We also get reimbursements uh, from airports as well as the Harbor Department. Are those ones low? It's because of the cap rate. So those are less than what we anticipated or Correct. budgeted Correct. from those proprietary departments? Correct. Correct. So, so, Councilman, just to uh, provide some clarity, what happens is that when we put together budgets, we usually are using a, uh, an older cap rate that, um, because there's always a new cap rate being worked on by the controller's office, once that gets approved, then that's the cap rate then we have to use uh, to make, uh, you know, to, to receive these reimbursements. And the cap rate that was more recently approved is lower than the one that was uh, used originally to budget. Got it. Interesting. Um, even though those, the, just so I understand it, so the time though that the department was on scene or providing service during that cap rate before the adjustment was made, is the adjustment retroactive? The adjustments uh, using the, the new cap rate, um, it's essentially when uh, departments may start using it as soon as it's been established, but usually it's not until it's been adopted by the federal government. They, they've agreed to use that cap rate that most departments then start using that on a go-forward basis until the next cap rate is, is put together. But there's, some, there's been some instances where we know the cap rate's going to change, and so departments will start kind of calculating their budgets based on the, the, the cap rate that's essentially in the works. Uh, interesting. Okay. And then the... Um The ambulance services budget, it's also, um, it says that there's uh, less gains in, in, in that. And if you can walk us through that as well. When the current um, fiscal year um, budget was prepared by the mayor and the CAO's office, um, I believe it was based on um, a suggestion from one of the fire department's vendors indicating that um, <coughs> There are some additional productivity gains that could be derived uh, as a result of contracting out for those services. Um, unfortunately, that, will, that information conveyed to the CAO's office uh, and to the mayor's office was not concurred with uh, by the department, but it was placed within the fire department budget as a, as a level of expectation uh, with respect to um, productivity improvements. Um, when you say it wasn't concurred by the fire department, was that part of then, you're talking about last fiscal year during the budgetary correct. process? And correct. was that outlined then in the fire department's memo, that they had concern over those projections? Um, in that uh, memo, I don't believe it was, sir. I think we uh, raised it a little later after. Uh, the so in hindsight, you now have concern over. <laughs> okay. So we didn't meet those projections? No. And was that formula used or some of those, um, those productivity uh, perspective dollar amounts used going forward? Were, that, were those projected in this year's budget going forward? 
and do you have any concern over what was suggested in reimbursements or collections from ambulance billing and what is proposed in the next fiscal year if it wasn't part of this year's memo? Eating productivity gains actually um, as a result of contracting out was actually realized uh, during the first year of implementation. Right. It was about $8 million. And, uh, It was pretty significant, right? Yes, it was. Five. Uh, yeah. How much was it? Five. Okay. Five million. Okay. Um, so for that reason, to expect that $5 million in productivity gains in the third year of implementation of the contract, um, the department realized that that really was not realistic. And, and if, in fact, those productivity gains were going to be realized, one would assume that the department would have already worked with the contractors uh, to realize that. Um, so on a go-forward basis, um, we don't anticipate that whatever productivity gains a contractor believed uh, could be implemented um, would, would be realized. Um, so what we're projecting for, from ambulance revenues for next fiscal year is pretty constant um, yeah, from the current it. fiscal yeah. year. Right. Okay. Well, but, but just for clarity on that, that, I think the point of the question was, was that same budget assumption including, included in the coming year? In terms of the productivity gains? Yeah. We, we did, well, we did not include that, and, and I didn't remember seeing that, you know, in, in the budget for next fiscal year. Mm, it was not. Okay. Yeah, it was consistent. I believe it was, this year was consistent with the current year. Our next year was consistent with the current year. Yes. Okay. But I think we had the discussion when we went through. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, just one follow-up on the uh, proprietary reimbursements. What are the categories of events that uh, the DWP reimburses the department for? You know, some might be waiting time when there's a risk of electricity exposure, for example. Uh, but what are some others? Would, would a downed power line causing a fire, for example, be a grounds for reimbursement? The city attorney has indicated that the only uh, reimbursement that we could uh, seek uh, would be for uh, the wait time or the standby time, uh, so that um, when water and power—I'm sorry—when when the fire department uh, staff is responding to a 911 call um, and there is an emergency that needs to be mitigated um, uh, to protect the public and also to secure the scene prior to water and power crews arrive, it's that wait time that we could seek. Uh, re reimbursement for, and it's it's only the wait time that we could seek reimbursement for. If water, uh, I'm sorry, I keep saying water. If the fire department you know, responds to a 911 call and there is no need uh, for them to stand by and and they mitigate uh, the incident and they leave, then there is no reimbursement that is sought. So it's only the standby time that that we're seeking reimbursement. Okay, Mr. Kratz, anything for fire? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that brings us to street services. Mr. Wonder, do you want to start hmm. off? How you doing? Uh, sure. Thank you. Um, so in looking at um, the Bureau's shortfall uh, in weed abatement, landscape maintenance, um, well, I'm not even, there's, there's a lot of different issues. Um, some of the expenditures and, uh, and reserve fund loans um, required to balance the Bureau's budget. Uh, I've got some concerns that uh, there's some issues with the department that uh, need to be looked into. Can, can you just walk us through um, where you're at your end and Absolutely, what Councilman. you're doing to proactively ensure that we don't begin the beginning of the year uh, with these same issues? Joe Cruz with Bureau of Street Services. I think, Council Member, that the item that you have um, concern over is the $8.5 million in, in borrowing uh, identified in the CAO report. Um, we've reviewed uh, Attachment 7. We concur with that figure. Um, of that amount, $5.6 million is, is uh, due to pending transfers from special funds, and $2.9 million of that amount is due to unfunded expenditures. Uh, if you approve the actions um, in this report, uh, 1.4 million uh, of of the um, 
pending transfers would come almost uh, immediately from uh, CDD and DOT. Uh, an additional $4.2 million uh, it would come from ARA uh, for reimbursement of related costs. Uh, so that would total uh, $5.6 million. Uh, we're currently going through a closeout process on the ARA program. Um, we expect to complete that process uh, before the end of the calendar year. So by uh, December of 2013, we should have the $4.2 million uh, reimbursing uh, the general fund. Uh, with respect to the unfunded expenditures the, that we've identified as uh, general fund um, uh, obligations, uh, I, I would like to take a little bit of a step back and, and give you a, a, some history on um, how we arrived at that figure. Uh, the actual unfunded expenditure in 2011-12 consisted of uh, approximately $1.7 million uh, for the historic windstorm event that occurred in December of 2011. Uh, approximately 1.7 million relating to bargaining agreements and uh, early retirement program payouts. Approximately 0.3 million in uh, a shortfall relative to the traffic safety fund that was not identified until after the close of the fiscal year. Uh, about a half million dollars in uh, the landscape um, maintenance program costs and uh, 1.4 million dollar short shortfall in our weed abatement program. Uh, moving forward, uh, with, re with respect to um, emergency type issues like the windstorm event, um, those are unpredictable events uh, and, and as first responders we, we essentially just have to absorb that cost. Uh, to the extent that we can, we, we will absorb those costs. Um, the total of all those items that I, I had identified was 5.6. And in the final report, we're looking at a unfunded expen expenditure of about 2.9. So we have been some have had some success in trying to uh, mitigate those unfunded expenditures, but unfortunately, 2.9 million dollars represents that amount that we can no longer absorb. Um, again, giving you some um, history in 07-08, uh, we had a general fund allocation to the Bureau of $48.6 million, and in fiscal year 2011-12, that amount had been reduced to 15.8 for a reduction of 67% in our general fund allocation. So we, we do the best that we can to try to mitigate um, any unfunded expenditures, but when we have such limited general fund, it becomes very difficult to try to absorb uh, any amount. And when was the last time, and just looking through your spreadsheet and trying to track it, it's, um, it's very difficult. Uh, there's not a lot of information in detail. Um, Are you referring to attachment seven, council member? Yeah. And, and when was the last time you've, you've actually gone through and uh, had an audit of these particular funds? Our, our gas tax fund is, is audited. Um, Annually, and of course we participate in state auditors. State. And the correct. gas tax is down by seven and a half million this year. That's correct. Why is that? The revenues into the gas tax fund are based on a volume of um, gas that's purchased in uh, in the state, and then as allocated to the various jurisdictions. Um, I, I think the, the CAO had previously reported on this and indicated that the um, volume of gas purchases has, in fact, gone down. Uh, we concur with that, um, that interpretation. Um. Yeah, we can, we can come back if you have, have more. Yeah, Just a couple, a couple of... Um, things. Uh, so there hasn't been a controller audit of your special funds in, in some time? Uh, not specifically that I'm aware of in recent history on, on our special funds. Of course, uh, we have been audited on, on various programs and to the extent that um, that investigation includes the special funds, we disclose uh, all that information. Okay. So since... Um, 
since it seems that the general fund is going to have to, under these recommendations, be reimbursing special funds, I guess my question for the CAO would be whether it's appropriate or possible to use unexpended special funds remaining uh, to offset some of uh, those general fund expenditures. Column A of Attachment 7 represents what the department could allocate to the special funds. So the remaining balance of the 4.2 is what could not be allocated to the special fund. Is that? If so I they make, tried to, oh, go ahead. <laughs> if I may, council member, um, as I indicated, we, we started actually with an unfunded expenditure of $5.6 million. Um, we brought that figure down to 2.9, and it was as a result of doing exactly as you said, looking at special funding sources and uh, assigning costs as we could to, to bring down that number. Uh, the number that's represented now in this report is um, a figure that we don't believe can be reduced any further. And are any of these special funds, um, do, do any of these special funds have an obligation to reimburse the general fund for uh, indirect or related costs other than as provided in here? Um, most typically do, but those are already programmed in the budget, and so it would, would not be above and beyond what's already expected. Um, the only amount that, that could be identified, uh, because I don't believe that it was included uh, in, in, the, um, in the budget, was the reimbursement of $4.2 million that I indicated would come from ARA as a result of the uh, closeout process. Okay. Um, on the Lifeline program, uh, in the second FSR, there was a deficit. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. That's sanitation. Never mind. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, Anything else? Yeah, just my recommendation would be um, perhaps to work with the controller's office um, about looking into um, perhaps some help in looking at identifying some of the special fund opportunities and ensure that you don't have to wait for an audit for that to happen. So I would highly recommend um, just because the volume and the different programs uh, that you work with the controller's office and, and it might be advisable to work with the, directly through the CAO as well and looking at all those uh, special funds and, and uh, transfers and, and not just wait until, since it's been a long time. Uh, we will do that. There's been an audit. We'll do that, Council. That would be my, my formal request. And, and I'd say that your bureau has as complicated um, uh, funding as a source of funds as any, uh, because you have to pull together um, funds from so many different areas, and the complexity of uh, these formulas and potential reimbursements one way or the other is, is extensive. So I think the more accounting help you can get to track that, the better. And um, the controller has her accounting pool, so you know maybe this would be an appropriate use of some of those resources to to assist the bureau in in that regard. Absolutely, it's a good Councilman, Councilman, um, I think uh, our office concurs that uh, there's definitely a need for for some accounting assistance here, and and if there is a part of the managed hiring process, if there's any vacancies, I think that's something that the department that the bureau should should be submitting to the managed hiring committee. Um, as part of their hiring process uh, early in the fiscal year. And um, uh, the case in point is that, as we mentioned in the report, uh, there's about a $15.6 million surplus that the Bureau currently doesn't really, can't really say where, where the surplus is, is being generated from, like which specific accounts, funds have that surplus. And so that's why it, it's not necessarily... Um, uh, we're not able to really say whether or not uh, one of these funds can cover uh, what otherwise would have been a general fund expense because we just don't know the, um, where these surpluses are, are currently located. Um, I, I, would, uh, I would strongly suggest that, uh, that you report back to this committee as well with um, what steps uh, you might be taking in the immediate future to work with the CAO and the controller's office uh, in looking at some of these issues. and. Uh, because they're, I can't make heads or tails out of it. And it doesn't yeah. sound like most of us can, and, and, and mostly because 
It is very complicated. There's a lot of state and federal reimbursements and guidelines and projects and um, uh, that have to be tracked uh, separately and differently and through various departments. But as we saw with what happened in transportation, for example, uh, while it's great when we hear that <coughs> there's $42 million coming back to us, it's not great that that had been sitting there for some period of time over 17 years and not looked at. Uh, and so um, I think we should look at these immediately. The, the fact that the controller actually, I believe, had a surplus this year um, tells us that there's opportunities and uh, for the controller's office and, again, CAO to work with you directly. And I think if you could report back um, as soon as possible to this committee on what steps it is you're going to take to look at some of these issues. Well, in fact, I, th I think we'll go one better than that. And Great. We'll suggest I, I completely concur working with the controller's office and the CAO to um, get a handle on um, the accounting processes here and to get you additional resources in the accounting arena if need be. Um, although I don't think that was one of the requests in the budget uh, memo, but um, if it's appropriate, it's something that we would certainly want to consider, and I, I would suggest that we move forward on that, that quickly. Um, what I'd like to ask, uh, in addition to the Bureau working with the CAO and the, and the controller, is um, so that we can monitor how well we're progressing and getting a handle on this, I'd like to ask the Bureau to come back uh, to this committee uh, in 30 days uh, and then at least for now, monthly thereafter, so that we can monitor the progress of, of pulling this together. Because I, I, I just don't think we want to be in a position where we're having to figure this out at the time of the FSR. And if we can help to provide a solution uh, that will make it easier for the Bureau, then, uh, then I think it's certainly this committee's intention to do that. So uh, let's go ahead and recommend that you work with the CAO and the controller um, to utilize the accounting pool or otherwise um, obtain the appropriate accounting resources necessary to correct these accounting deficiencies and um, to report in 30 days and monthly thereafter uh, on progress that we're making in, in, uh, in getting this in order. Absolutely. And it, to carry this back to the general manager that um, this is by no means a way of us looking at, hey, you're not looking at uh, your accounts and not being able to report back on some of these deficiencies but clearly there's just some red flags that say okay we need some help and uh, this committee is just uh, about just being that help we're from we're from the government we're here to help exactly I mean we we get it and we just don't want to be in a situation you know as we've seen in other parts of the city where we only figure it out 15 years later. <laughs> so we, we don't want to get into that situation again. So it's not a reflect. I mean, we get that it's complex and you need the resources to be able to deal with it. So uh, Thank you. we want to try to fix that problem. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, Mr. Kretz, anything further? Nothing else. Mr. England, anything further? Uh, no. Oh, I have one thing. <coughs> One additional recommendation uh, to the CAO, if I could, um, on on our um, our National League of Cities dues uh, was reduced this year, uh, and there's a surplus then that will be or should be swept. It wasn't in the FSR, but it should be. Um, it was a one-time, one-year savings, I believe that. They just passed on in an effort to help their member cities uh, that were going through difficult financial times. And uh, it was cut uh, substantially. So uh, I don't have the exact dollars, but um, I believe the current, the last, this current fiscal year's allotment or budgeted amount for the annual dues was about $75,000 approximately. And the, they had ended up charging us about $45,000. Uh, so we should sweep that difference uh, with two exceptions if I could make a re recommendation. Um, the Independent Cities Association um, is short, though, this year with um, some of their training activities as well as we're partners in that effort. 
uh, to the tune of about $10,000. So I would suggest that we use some of those funds going forward next year as we move it from nationally this current year for 10000 Then I would also suggest an additional 10000 out of that uh, to priority-based budget training, which is something uh, we didn't put in. We did put in a consultant into going into next fiscal year, but we didn't put staff training um, abilities in. So I would make that recommendation, then the balance then to be just swept into the general fund. Mr. Kretz, any concerns? Okay. So that. Um, on, on that recommendation, I think the, part of the, the more technical would be to reappropriate funds from the current GCP line item for League of Cities to next fiscal year for those two items. For those other two items. For those correct. two items, yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, that'll be fine. So uh, we have that amendment to the report. We have the CAO's uh, three uh, amendments, and the CLA has circulated uh, some amendments uh, as well that should be uh, before you. So with those collective amendments. And the uh, one that I had that I didn't submit in writing, which was just the uh, that one neighborhood council lease. Yes. Well, so uh, with those amendments, if there's nothing further, uh, members, uh, if, without uh, objection, the FSR will be approved. Thank you. As amended. As amended. All right. Oh, we still have. Say how that brings us to item number six. Number six. It's a joint report from the city administrative officer and the chief legislative analyst relative to proposed financial policy for the budget stabilization fund. Mr. Miller, welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> before you was a report that uh, that uh, our office has issued um, on April 15th and, and a clarification report um, that was issued today dealing with the budget stabilization fund. Um, again, very very briefly uh, for some background, um, the fund was was established some years ago and really had a minimal amount in at 500,000 as as a holding place for purposes of essentially smoothing out uh, changes in economy and revenues um, to to lessen the impacts of a downturn. Um, there was a charter amendment that also requires the establishment of the budget stabilization fund and requires the adoption of a, of a policy and ordinance. So the proposed policy is before you today. In essence, what we've done is looked at our seven um, largest revenue sources that make up about 70% of the budget and looked at their, at their performance over a 24-year period. Um, and the average growth in those revenue sources are 3.4%. So the, what the policy would propose, and, and the clarification issue today make, makes, uh, makes it clear, is on a budget-to-budget -budget basis, um, the growth in those revenue sources would be measured. The amounts over 3.4% would be deposited into the budget stabilization fund. And then the, the traditional growth of 3.4% would be programmed into the budget for services. Um, and I will say that, that the importance of that <clears throat> is that when we have spikes in revenue, when we have unusual revenue, revenue growth. Those are ongoing revenue sources. However, we can't expect that th that growth rate or those revenues can continue. Um, and really over a period of time, really dating back to uh, uh, 2005 when our offices released our financial policy report, in fact, over time, our expenditure rates were going up faster than our revenues. So the, again, the point would be to, lock, uh, to, to connect our ongoing long-term revenue growth to our ongoing uh, expenditures in approximately the 3.5 four um, percent level. Uh, the proposal for withdrawals would be um, that, that up to 25 percent of the budget stabilization fund could be drawn down in any one year. Now there are overrides in a fiscal emergency, um, so with, with the findings, uh, then the council and mayor could draw down further on the budget stabilization fund. So again, in, in summary, the whole point of this is in recognizing what we have been through for the last number of years and, and what a difficult time it was, and recognizing that we simply can't can't reduce our expenditures as quickly as revenue uh, might drop during a recession. To have a source of funding to go to to smooth out um, our, uh, our our budget um, deficits, so that our expenditure reductions can catch up to the revenue reductions and meet again and get back in structural balance. So, Ben, I don't know if you had anything else. To no, that essentially sums up the policy and as well as a. Uh, um, 
correct, uh, technical correction that was issued today. Okay. Mr. Kretz? Yeah, a couple of questions. One, um, most of these sources are relatively reliable. Uh, transient occupant, I mean, the, the documentary transfer tax is pretty volatile. So, you know, you could have 125 million one year and 50 million the next. Yes. So, in a good year, we put it all in this fund. In a bad year, we have a hole and the, the fund can't really respond very well to it. Um, how do you deal with that? Well, again, ov overall, um, uh, if, if uh, again, documentary transfer tax went from a high of, what, 230 million down to 107 at one point, um, if we find ourselves in a recessionary environment during the good years, the amounts, again, collectively over 3.4% are deposited into the budget stabilization fund. And then when we have a downturn, the policy would be that up to 25% of the balance in that fund can be drawn down as we're reducing expenditures. And then as revenues grow, we, we again meet, we meet back in the middle and we're back in structural balance. So I don't know if that answers your question. But. And I think yeah, just, I, I'm just not sure how, how easily this works out when you have uh, a source that's volatile. It doesn't necessarily track the economy. It can be more random than that, unlike the rest of these. Um, and you could find yourself dramatically short one year. Um, so I, I'm not sure about the wisdom of including this as opposed to finding some other way to balance this out more evenly. Well, I, um, because we are uh, using the seven, what we call the seven economically sensitive revenues, uh, that essentially is, is uh, provides that, um, you know, a wider portfolio, if you will, of revenues to use uh, for this policy. Uh, the other option that we looked at initially was only looking at the documentary transfer tax as the one and only source that would feed into the budget stabilization fund uh, in the peaks. When it's doing well, there would be a deposit from that um, equivalent to that, to that increase in documentary transfer tax made to the budget stabilization fund. And then the valleys when, you know, due to recession or, or housing market slump, um, that's when we would be eligible to, to get a, a withdrawal from the fund. Uh, but because it, it, it is so volatile, as you state, we're uh, focus, uh, basically base, basing the calculation on the seven uh, general fund revenues that, that come into um, uh, make up 70% of our general fund base. And, and I haven't studied it that closely, but I, so I don't know whether, whether it also tends to track the economy or whether it's as random as I think it is, and sometimes there are major transactions that can pump it up dramatically or other years not. As far as the documentary transfer tax? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it definitely does uh, uh, follow a trend with the housing market. I mean, that essentially as real estate values go up and assessed values rather that go up, um, it it's, uh, feeds into the uh, how much revenue we receive and as, it also is a, a function of the transactions taking place. And I think the, the intent of using the seven really, when, when collectively when you look at them, th there, there is some relative stability because again, the documentary transfer tax may drop precipitously, but property tax may not. There may be far fewer transactions, but property values may not be impacted or Prop 13 clearly uh, impacts the, the swing in property tax because many properties out there are still significantly undervalued. So the, the, the goal would be to look at the seven to have, uh, you know, again, more smoothing out. And again, the, the expectation would be that when there's a drop in any one of these taxes, there wouldn't be a draw on the budget stabilization fund. Uh, we may not make a deposit into that fund in any given year, but that doesn't mean that we'll actually need to, the, the, the intent would be to balance the budget without making withdrawals. But when we do hit a big recessionary period and there is no other way to balance the budget and, and cut our services to match our, our expenditures and our revenues uh, uh, that quickly, that would be the source to go to. The other concern I have is, uh, well, number one, I'm not sure exactly how we pick the, the 25 percent, so uh, that's a question I'd ask you first. Uh, why not 30 or 35 percent or 40 percent? Well, 25 percent is, is basically just um, um, as we look at, 
at the outlook, we always use four years, and so I think 20, using 25 percent would theoretically allow us to to tap into the budget stabilization fund for those four years of the budget outlook that we track as we uh, you know show the forecast. Uh, so that's the only reason. But as as uh, the CLA stated earlier, they are. Uh, um, there's flexibility in the policy that would allow the council and the mayor to to make findings to tap into the uh, make a larger withdrawal than 25 percent if those findings are there or in the event of a, a fiscal emergency as we've had in the past so oh, walk me through what the findings are other than a fiscal emergency because I in some ways I would I would still consider this a fiscal emergency we're still projecting out you know significant shortfalls because we we haven't really uh, resolved our, our structural problems yet, but I don't think we can call it an emergency. This is already four years into the emergency. So we wind up $150 million short next year, um, and we're only able to take out 25%. Is there any other way we can get to more of that 25% as opposed to having to lay people off still at this, this late stage? Well, I, I, go ahead. I was just saying, I mean, in, in the final analysis, determining whether there's a fiscal emergency is going to be up, up to the mayor and the council. Um, and, and so, I mean, it's, it's, it wouldn't be a finding of a um, natural disaster type emergency. I mean, it, it's, it essentially is up to the, 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 the council and the mayor to make that finding. Well, I suspect we couldn't any longer do large-scale furloughs, for instance, on the basis that it's an emergency, because this is an emergency that's lasting such a long time that it, it doesn't really fit the definition. But at the same time, we, are, we could be in a very problematic fiscal situation again. So are, are we constrained that carefully, um, as carefully as we would to have to justify furloughs and other dramatic measures? No, because in, in, in furloughs, you're impacting the compensation for employees. I mean, there's a much much different level of of challenge there. This, in essence, is, is a pot of money that with, you know, a, a supermajority of the council and mayor, they can access if they make a finding of a fiscal emergency. So there, the flexibility is there, um, but the intent is to really have that discussion um, very openly and transparently about the fact of whether or not there are other options aside from drawing on the budget stabilization fund to meet a gap. And obviously, I think we all would rather resolve this ongoing structural shortfall than have to dip into it. But um, just in case that does happen, I'd, I'd like to know that we had a little more flexibility than that. Well, just to clarify that, because we're using the term fiscal emergency, which in a sense is a term of art uh, used in the law. So to step back from that a little bit, the report indicates, at least at, at page four, that under this policy, uh, the 25% the limit could be waived if there's a fiscal emergency or if the council and the mayor suspend that requirement based on a finding that it's in the best interest of the city to That's suspend. Right. Yes. So that's a much broader yes. uh, uh, set of uh, findings than fiscal emergency in the limited sense that we've been thinking of it in terms of furloughs and, and that's right. so forth. So pretty much any time the council and the mayor concur that it's in the best interest of the city, as long as it's transparently done and we state our reasons and we debate it and it's publicly uh, done, that we have the ability to do that. That's right. right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, were you done, Mr. Yes. Mr. Ingram. No, thank you. You asked all my questions. Um, but I, I did have uh, some some comments on and concern over the same issues on withdrawals. And I understand the fiscal emergency elements. And I understand that uh, we can actually declare a fiscal emergency every year for consecutive years as long as we so choose if we meet those definitions and, though, risk our bond ratings in doing well, so. Um, so. And I actually, to... to uh, formally declare a fiscal emergency requires a resolution that council and the mayor would have to pass uh, right. uh, prior to the budget being adopted. Mm -hmm. No, I understand, and we've done it, and, and, and we're fortunate not to have to do it again uh, currently, but with that, um, the, or uh, uh, if, if the policy is suspended by the council or mayor, um, I didn't feel actually that went far enough, quite frankly, in the opposite direction that it didn't specify particularly what the best interest of the city 
might might be. Um, well, my phone. <laughs> oh, probably. Um, the uh, I think it's not mine. Okay. Um, the I'd like to see some more definition on that. Also, don't know if that requires a supermajority of a, of the council. I think it should. Um, so the the dollars aren't <coughs> politicized in what one deems important from a policy change, whether it's you know, I don't want to give any examples, but if somebody comes forth um, and says that one department needs something that's really important that wasn't part of the budget, and it becomes a political issue more than a policy issue of trying to restore a particular service for the rest of a calendar year and could wipe us out. And so I think there needs to be a little more um, on what the suspension of the policy would fall under under what types of criteria um, and one-time funding and what that means and perhaps um, a supermajority of the council as well. Um, but I think that's, that's what we need. Everything else is, is I think this is great. Um, in terms of the index, I too looked at that and the fact that, um, first of all, I want to applaud you for looking at the national conference, the state legislature is looking at uh, what's been done and, and the methods and methodologies that were used and studied. I think there's a lot of work that actually went into looking at uh, everyone else in other jurisdictions and on other levels of government are doing to fund uh, their budget stabilization efforts um, and examining and combining that um, and looking at uh, those best practices and coming up with these seven. Uh, I actually want to applaud you on that because the ebb and flows of each one of these and, and the, for the very same reasons that Mr. Koretz actually pointed out. Um, uh, I, I, I too looked at that and, and thought that this was well thought out from that perspective. And, uh, but I would like to see a recommendation on perhaps what we could do um, on the withdrawals. Um, on, uh, and what would, what would you suggest if there's anything off the top of your head? Because I think we should move the policy as soon as possible. I don't want to hold it up. Um, from my perspective, but um, if there's any ideas that uh, that would come to mind outside of just the simple fact of a supermajority, but what findings it would have to meet as well. well I defining think best interests of the city, you mean? Yes, and defining best interests of the city. And I mean, I know other policies have, have that language with regard to best interests of the city. I think it, it's uh, the waiver policy, for example, may have some of that um, language in there. So we would probably want to be consistent with what's already been established in the policy like that. But you did mention the one-time funding, and, and I, I, I would agree that if there is a suspension of the policy that goes towards funding a source, uh, because this is really a one-time source of funding, there should probably should be a connection to the one-time for one time. Um, and this shouldn't necessarily be used to fund an ongoing expenditure. And I think we've got to look at that. If, if we're near the end of it, and that's oftentimes when this will come into play, is towards the end of a fiscal year. I mean, this shouldn't kick in as a conversation at the beginning of a fiscal year unless it's just part of the budget. But at the year end, if somebody's trying to make a department whole or pick up right. services that were falling short, that's where I have a concern that it's actually not one time because while there might be fixing six weeks of funding to get through the year, we're going to we're going to inherit then if it's not part of the next year's fiscal budget proposal that ongoing shortfall. And so we've got to identify that. I think my initial, my initial reaction to that would be in those situations, we would go to the reserve fund and then the reserve fund would have to be reappropriated. The, the ideal, ideal would be to not touch this fund except as part of the budget process when we realize going forward we're seeing a drop in revenues and we are unable uh, to balance the budget without going to this source of funding. But we can look at other, uh, other policies where... That's why I think it needs to be where, strengthened a little bit. In right. coming up with <clears throat> not just some right. somebody identifying again um, some political issue of what a service is more important than others, or um, perhaps the police department was redeploying officers, for example, and decided to. And I don't want to give examples, but it, in, a, in a, just a scenario that could exist, um, and saying we're going to take some basic cars out of some service areas because we're having an issue in one part of the city with a certain particular type of crime. And so for a couple of weeks, we're going to redeploy some units out of each division 
and it becomes a political issue and says, well, I don't want to, you know, one of the council members say, I don't want to be without a basic car, and therefore we should use, tap into the budget stabilization effort to fund, temporarily fund, and redeploy services. I, I, those are the situations well, as we're I don't working, think we should yeah. get into. Sure. I mean, as we're working with the city attorney and the CAO to develop the ordinance, we can come back with, look at other policy documents, and come back with defining what best interest is. Best interest is, what one-time funding is, and Correct. also well, supermajority. Supermajority, my, my suggestion would be um, uh, 10 with the 12 vote yep. override. Yes, um, yep. great. Yeah. I, I, I would think that either defining best interests with specific uh, criteria or a supermajority would probably be the, the right course, but having specific findings and a supermajority might be a step a, a step too far. But we can look at that. I, I, I think, think, I look I think yeah. we need something. But as far as the, the mid-year issues, I would say that under no circumstances, under no circumstances should there ever be borrowing or use of the budget stabilization fund mid-year for any purpose. That's why we have a, a UB. That's why we have a, a reserve. Um, so I mean, this is this is intended for another purpose entirely, and I, it should never be used as um, just an addition to the reserve fund that we can uh, then tap into in, in, in mid -year. Yeah, and I think that that was the intent. Is that it, it, this is something that gets deliberated during the budget process, exactly. and to, to determine, you know, are we going to stick to the 25 percent cap, or for whatever reason we can't find enough solutions to close that final gap that may be above 25 percent, that's when the council and the mayor would deliberate how much to budget for in the following fiscal year. But you're right, council member, it's, it shouldn't be used on an interim budget appropriation basis um, to, to make up gaps and things of that nature. That's more the role for the, of the UB reserve that yeah. we established, um, and to the extreme cases, a reserve fund. Now, this might be too fine of a philosophical point, but I mean, we had this discussion about just a moment ago about using this for one-time purposes. I would say, in fact, it's not for yeah. one-time purposes. In fact, it is to stabilize, the to stabilize yeah. ongoing <laughs> expense using one-time spikes in revenue that are balance out the one-time drops in revenue for ongoing expense. So it's a little bit of a philosophical distinction there, yeah. but um, uh, just for the no, you're correct. Sake I, I agree. Clarity on it. So um, I'm sorry. Read yeah. the the. Uh, benchmark is this 20 year 25 year average of these revenues it was 25 years it was 24 okay so a um, couple of things on that number one I would hope I, I would imagine that that's intended to be a running average it isn't fixed at 3.4 forever under this ordinance it should be a running average of the previous 20 or 25 years right now it's a fix that's as the policy is drafted is based on the fixed 3.4 percent okay uh, I think I just think it makes more sense to have a you know it's an easy calculation to make isn't it so that every year we would know budget stabilization fund is determined by it may be a tricky legal issue I don't know but I, I would think it should it's best it makes the most sense formulaically to have it be a running average um, so. um, I guess my only concern with that would be in, during periods of high revenue growth, your average is going to continue to increase above the 3.4. So you may get to 3.7, yeah. you may get to 4. <clears throat> so now, you, and now you've got a, basically, you've got a larger base over which the money would come from. And then conversely, if you're in a recessionary period and you're seeing drops in revenue, then you're going from 3.4 to 3.2. So I think in essence, you, if you were to do an annual true up, or a, a annual recalculation, I think you would end up with a more volatile fund. It may make some sense every maybe five years right. to to relook at the standard to have it smoothed out. But I would be concerned with doing an annual look at the three point four percent. I think it actually but does make sense. But looking at it, perhaps like five years from now to go back and then coming up with a different type of smoothing over a period of time. But there's no particular magic to this particular period of time, though, no, and the no. idea is to stay, is to truly use surplus funds, funds above what our 
average is. Yeah, it was so basically as far back chain. as we had data on the documentary transfer tax because it's not a, it's not, you know, this this tax wasn't around forever as, as long as the property tax and some of these other taxes. So it was as, as far back data as we had for, for all these seven together. Okay. Um, this is a bit of a fine point, but we have a very specific figure right now, 3.4. Um, if there's, if it's a penny below 3.4 under this policy, we would, it would be an eligible year to make a withdrawal from, uh, from the fund, um, of up to 25% of the fund. I think there's a defect there when we might have a million dollar shortfall and we can dip in 30 million dollars into the budget stabilization fund it shouldn't be that um, so there's a few things that we could do to correct that one would be to make um, uh, some uh, span above or below 3.4 so if it's so a margin above 3.5 that's when we'd make deposits if it's below 3.3 that's when we would be able to to make withdrawal, something like that. It's just uh, so that you don't have that that one single bright line of either being a good year or a bad year. Um, there is going to be some fluctuation, and there's mediocre years too. <laughs> if we're running pretty close to average, we probably shouldn't be impacting. We shouldn't certainly shouldn't be withdrawing from the budget stabilization fund, and I don't know that we necessarily need to make significant additions to it at that. point at that point. Certainly I'm concerned about the withdrawals unless there's a some fic, unless there's some s significant shortfall below average revenues. I think that was the intention of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the withdrawals weren't said to be automatic withdrawals. It would be part of the budget deliberation and budget process to uh, right. Now the policy provides that withdrawals can be can be made when projected revenues are expected to fall below 3.4. Um, so what happens if that turn, those projections turn out not to be the case, or vice versa? If we're projecting revenues to be above 3.4, so we budget in an appropriation for the budget stabilization fund, and then mid-year comes and it turns out, oh shucks, we're actually below projected revenues. So what do we do in that circumstance? But the, uh, I think in that circumstance, it's just like any other uh, mid-year adjustment that would probably be required. We would have to look at not just that fund in particular, but across the board, all the appropriations made to the city because I'm assuming that if we're falling way below projected revenue, then that's going to be the least of our problems. It's I, gonna be I think if, if we're mid-year and we're below 3.4% of our projected revenue, it's more than, oh, shucks. I think the words might be a little stronger, but I get it. Well, no. I mean, the, the, the you know the, the point being, if yes. we're just a little above, we've already we've already budgeted for an appropriation to the budget stabilization fund of however many millions of dollars, and then it turns out we're just a bit below that. Then all of a sudden we're at zero contribution to the budget stabilization fund. So um, we've already put it in the budget. Do we then back it out of the budget in in mid year? since it's based on projected <coughs> revenues? Well, I think that the, the, the preference would be like any other, to sort of not look at the budget stabilization fund and like any other expenditure or revenue variance, make that up through the FSRs, through expenditure reductions, or finding other sources. But yes, ultimately, the, 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 if there were no other opportunities, the fund would be a source of funding if the revenues did fall below the projected 3.4. Okay. So as long as there's some flexibility yeah. I, so that through the year, as we know what actual revenues well, are, and I, we can I do think, so. Um, where, uh, where that might be addressed somewhat, and not 100%, uh, but somewhat, is as we're building the as we were building the 1314 revenue budget, as uh, as an example, we were going off of the revised 1213 budget. So so the 1314 budget already accounted for the growth we saw in 1213, and so that's um, you know that's why it's uh, it's at the level it is now. It's because we accounted for the growth. Otherwise, if we were just basing it based on the the adopted budget for for um, 12, 13, the growth would have been a lot higher. We, you would have seen a lot bit, a larger growth, uh, but because it's based already on a higher revised based, um, 
Now that already accounted for some of that movement in this fiscal year. So likewise, had the 12-13 budget, had we already been projecting shortfalls from the adopted 12-13, that would have been rolled into our calculations for the 13-14 revenue. So we wouldn't be basing our revenue for 13-14 based on uh, necessarily what we adopted, but um, on the actuals. And if the actuals were, sh were to have shown that we were lower, we would have adjusted 13-14 accordingly. Okay. Just and as long as there's flexibility to be able to yes. do that in the course of the of approving the FSRs, I think that's that's my only concern. I mean, I don't want to open it up, as we mentioned earlier, to withdrawals for mid-year purposes. But I think adjustments based on actual project actual revenues compared to projected revenues is appropriate to, to do that. And Mr. Um, Corin, just very briefly yeah. to your prior point about um, re-looking at the the revenue mix. As Sharon pointed out to me, I mean, certainly policy decisions are going to play into this. So we'll have to work at the language in the ordinance. But there is going to have to be built into this really a constant review of that. I mean, you are discussing, in fact, getting rid of the business tax. So depending upon what happens to the business tax, whether it's reduced or eliminated, that is likely to affect the mix of taxes and may impact the 3.4 percent. So we'll have to make sure that the ordinance does does very, specify a provision for re-looking at the mix of revenues and, and the, the assumed growth assumptions. Well, that's a great point. So that if there's any policy decision that's made about any of these revenue sources, that's going to change the potentially change the baseline. Yes. And you have to somehow figure out how to apply that retroactively for 20 years in order to get a true baseline. Right. OK. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try to figure out how to deal with it in the ordinance, but it's a point well taken. So. OK, very good. Um, the suspension language that we talked about earlier, um, it, it occurred to me, too, that um, we talked about being able to suspend in the best interests of the city in order to increase the amount of the withdrawal. Um, is there, should there be any provision that, I can't, I can't conceive of a scenario right now where this might happen, but in a future year, a council might decide that it's in the best interests of the city in a good year to budget less of a contribution into the budget stabilization fund. Is there a provision by which that end of the equation could also be considered for suspension? Because right now, the only thing we can mm -hmm. suspend is the cap on withdrawals, as I'm reading this. But we don't under the language of this, have the ability to suspend the mandatory contribution? I think in, in, in practice, since this is going to be part of the budget process, that, that's inherent. Um, we certainly wouldn't want to set up in the ordinance uh, something that could lead to litigation. So I, I, I do understand your point. Um, but since it is part of the budget process, which obviously has the council and, and mayor voting on it, whatever vote threshold we may we may want to set up a higher vote threshold again uh, yeah. to to not make the deposit would require again a supermajority of the council rather than the standard you know eight votes on the budget. Yeah, and you there know, could so. be. I mean, I could see since we're starting to try to take a more forward-looking view of our budget and not just look at one year at a time, there might be times when we see that two years from now or three years from now there's something that uh, we know is coming up and we need to start planning for it. Yes, and actually we do, we do have language in the actual policy attachment where we state that a downward adjustment may only be made to maintain the reserve fund at 5%. So as we're building the budget and we need to maintain the reserve fund at 5 that would take precedent. Okay. Um, but also we say to comply with the CIP policy, that's already an existing policy in place. So also to the extent that we wanted to keep the reserve fund at 5, make our 1% contribution to CIP, those would be the reasons why we won't, wouldn't necessarily be able to deposit the full amount in that fiscal year. And again, we have in the event of a fiscal emergency, and again, we have the uh, policy suspended by the city council and mayor based on findings that it's in the best interest of the city. OK. E even with regard to deposits? Even with regard okay. to deposits. I mean, that yes. would never be the case when there's a fiscal emergency, because then if there's a fiscal emergency, we're obviously below 3.4. But, uh, yeah. uh, but it might be in the best interest. Of the city. OK, so as long as that's provided for. And then finally, um, there's a 15 percent uh, threshold after which 
let's see, how did, how did we articulate this? When the, res when the combination of the reserve fund and the budget stabilization fund hit 15%, then we can begin to allocate this money out for this, the surplus above 15 to, for infrastructure and other one-time uses. 15% seems wildly high to me. I mean, mm -hmm. triple our existing uh, reserve threshold seems very, very high for us to begin to do that. If we had double our current reserve uh, available for budget stabilization, you know, in general, between the reserve and the budget stabilization fund, you know, even if it was 10%, it seems to me that it might be a, be a more prudent use of our money to start fixing streets than to um, put, keep pouring more money into the fund that we can only withdraw 25% of in any given year. So my, my view is that that percentage is too high. Mr. Kretz? Um, I would tend to disagree based on experience of practices of another city that I was on the council of West Hollywood, which I believe is now at around 100% of their, their annual budget in reserve. And that enabled them during this worst shorf, shortfall to have actually a very robust capital improvement program. Um, I think it makes more sense to, to set aside more money, position yourself well on an ongoing basis, and then start uh, putting money into the capital, capital improvement projects and other things. I think long term, if we're able to keep in that financial situation, we could be doing that hopefully for decades and keep ourselves uh, on, on solid ground for a very lengthy period of time. Councilmember, I, I, I would probably agree that 50% was a little bit aggressive on our end, but I think we were looking at, um, if you look on the revised uh, draft we sent out to you on page three, there's a simulation of the deposits that would have been made had this policy been in place dating back to 2005 or 6 and if you see what the deposit would have been made it's it's about 221 million dollars that combined with uh, the reserve fund which probably would have been at, at around 200 or so to be at 5% would essentially put the put us at 10% um, had that been the, ca the case and even then we wouldn't have had enough to really balance ourselves during the the, the course of the recession this is just looking on the theoretical basis based on the simulation that we put together. Okay, well, um, I mean, I, I, we can always, we can always be there's room uh, for putting more money yes. into uh, saving for the future, but every dollar that we do that with the trade-off is that sure. we're losing current services. So, you know, it's it's one thing to be prudent, uh, but it's another thing to be, you know, starving current services in order to fund future shortfalls. So, um, I, I, it just seemed to me that um, having that kind of a cap on it really cuts us short in our ability to. Uh, do the things that need to be done in, in current years, even um, even when we're in pretty solid ground. I mean, we are now at a reserve level that we haven't been in a decade, and to add an, another 10 percent on top of that before we can get to a point where we can start taking money and spending it on one-time uses uh, seems extremely aggressive to me. I don't have anything further. Anything further, members? So, um, I don't know how defined these answers need to be in order to advance this. This is going to be an instruction to the city attorney anyway, right? Yes. So, um, have we just muddied the waters for you more? Or, or well, is if, there, is maybe there, if I could just summarize a few of the points and, and the CLA can jump in if, if I'm missing something. There was definitely um, some concurrence that I heard about having a, uh, a timeline of when the 3.4 percent would be reviewed and the number uh, I, it was five years. Is that? Okay. Okay. And then there was a um, uh, whether or not there would be uh, best interest would be def further defined or if a supermajority was going to be sufficient for that. Is that right? 
as well, I those are kind of two with... different policy choices, actually. Um, whether to do a super majority or to further define uh, what best interests mean, and I don't know that we resolved that. Um, I think Mr. Englander's preference was to have both uh, super majority and a more defined uh, term. I was. I probably agree with that. Of having both. Yeah, I think we should okay. still narrow it down at least somewhat. I don't know how restrictive we have to be, but I think we should at least define it. Okay. Well, then I'll go with that too. So we'll um, we'll move it to a supermajority with greater definition uh, in what is in the best interest of the city. Okay. And then the other one was um, having a, a, a range between um, when to actually make the deposits and when to actually make the withdrawals. Is that... I think that was your recommendation. Yeah, and I have to say, I'm just kind of thinking out loud with that okay. one, so I'm sorry if I'm not giving you very good direction. I, members, does that, is, uh, has that even been considered? Have you seen that in other examples where you have a spectrum in which there's no deposit or withdrawal? Um, uh, uh, y yes, again, I think that, that the... Um, it shouldn't be assumed that withdrawals all, with, withdrawal is automatic if we're less than 3.4%. Um, I could see... I don't assume it's automatic, Ooh, but I right. do know that there will be eager council members who will want to, you know, take advantage where, where possible. So, you know, and, and, it may not and be I, automatic under the policy, but it might be in practice. I, I think perhaps the best way to address that would be with the supermajority and the fine, best interest findings that would have to apply to that as well. Um, I, I I have to think about it, but I, I think they're interlinked. If uh, if if again, if there's less than three point four percent, there there wouldn't be a deposit. If it's three point six percent, the point two percent, yeah. I think that if the supermajority and the best interest findings would say that you wouldn't make that point um, two percent deposit, I think that might cover it. The only thing I'm trying to get at here, really, is if you're at 3.39% annual growth in revenues, you really shouldn't be touching the budget stabilization fund. Right. But this policy, as, as it's proposed, allows the council to dip into up to 25% of the budget stabilization fund, even though, you know, maybe the shortfall is less than that. If I may, I think what you're looking at is a scale. Yeah. That if it's exactly. slightly below 3.4%, that somewhere between 3.3 .3 and 3.4, that you don't use 25%, but you use 10%. So I think that's what you're That would be a, a good approach to, to address that, yeah. Okay. And I guess the final question would be your, your point, Mr. Chair, about the, the total of 15% or 10%. You, you want us to bring back options? Um, Again, I think if we were at the 15%, what we experienced, if we actually had about $400 million in the budget stabilization fund in addition to the reserve fund, we would pretty much have ended up being balanced. And that would be a total of about 15% total. Now, I do understand the recession we went through was pretty extreme. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't expect that to occur very often. Um, but about 10% in the budget stabilization fund and a 5% reserve fund pretty much would have gotten us there. I mean, are there other, what other big cities have a, essentially a 15% reserve? Is, I'm, it's great that West Hollywood does, but, you know, that's... I think that's Beverly really Hills has much larger than 50% okay. also. Yeah. But those, those are not really very fair comparisons. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I mean, I mean, is there any other city that, that would even remotely come close to that? I mean, I know I, we, we would be the research, best. Um, when the reserve fund policy was being established uh, a couple years back, back in 2005, there was, there was specific research done on that, on that uh, specific question. Um, just off the top of my head, I just, I don't recall which ones they were. Um, but, well, you know, for I, now, yeah. I, I, it, I could, uh, I can enlighten you if I could actually read the attachment was this, just in curiosity, was this, I've never seen anything printed in two-point type? Was oh. this, <laughs> and you still haven't. I, still haven't. I, like I think there's words in the ink some, somewhere. Is this, is this actually two-point type? Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is, this is the, the way the source document was put together. Yours is, because yours got printed in portrait. Mine's in landscape, so it's a little easier. Is that easier. what it is? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a lot smaller than the actual. 
I don't know. There's several pages of it. I, there, there are a few. If you can read it, uh, there are a few states and cities that do have in excess of 10%. For example, the state of Massachusetts establishes a uh, 15%. Uh, the state of Maine uh, says the fund may not exceed 12% of the general fund. So there are a few. Uh, that's the page that I read, but okay. there might be more uh, if I have that. Nevada is 15. Um, Nevada has a, uh, not to exceed 15% of total appropriations. Okay. So, you know, I, given the fact that we've um, sort of exhausted this discussion about the potential for suspension and so on, I suppose we always can fall back on the best interests of the city being to devote anything over 12% to infrastructure or something. That might be a decision that, that we would make. So we would have the ability to suspend um, in that case in any event. So let's just leave it as is for now. If anybody else thinks that this is a good idea, maybe we can take it up at council. But we, we would, I mean, that's not the only way we can get to that money, in other words. We could always suspend and make a withdrawal if it were to be in the best interest of the city. So, okay, I'm good with it. All right, anything else on that? Anything else, Mr. Sauer? No. That's it. No. Okay. Then with the benefit of all that discussion, uh, it will be the action of the committee to uh, approve the policy. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it merits the discussion. It's a big policy. Yeah. And, it's and an important it's, policy. It is a very important policy, and we've seen the benefit of it in this very year's budget. So thank you all for your work on this. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Before we actually act on that, uh, Mr. McQuiston uh, submitted a card on number six. So, um, I guess we have to reconsider this matter. Without Jim McQuiston. Mr. McQuiston. Uh, I did want to make a comment. I thought some, your discussion was very, very good, and I'd like to comment after discussion to see if I can fill in something. And one of the things I can fill in is, you know, one city council cannot bind the next city council on anything. So really your maximum length of time is probably two years because we have two years, we'll have another election, have a different composition of city council. So it's important for us to control our budget. And we do that really absolutely well. But uh, I think we don't want to get off the point. The other, th the other thing is, you know, we just had a big uh, fiasco with the billboard uh, ordinance in uh, the uh, uh, courts, and the court said, you know, you can't give away your public safety for the, for uh, the future, and that's really what we're talking about is our public safety because that's what we're using it for. And the third thing I want to say is that Prop 13D and, and C really say that you can't charge more than what you're actually uh, performing. And if the whole idea of having some kind of a surplus in a budget stabilization means you actually charge too much one year. And you may run into some zealots who are going to say, well, yeah, you, can't, you just can't do that. And so the idea is perfect, but actually the execution may be something which uh, evaporates in thin air. And I did want to put those three things in that they ought to think about. All right. Thank you. And I hope the city attorney will certainly be considering uh, those issues as they're preparing the ordinance. So um, uh, with that, there's no further cards. So uh, it will now be the action of the committee to approve the policy. Uh, as, as amended. Mr. Seha, anything further? I, item number uh, nine. Sorry. It's a um, CEO report relative to the requested refund, uh, about $2.6 million to the Community Re Redevelopment Agency, Los Angeles, as a designated local authority for unexpended advance payments for design and construction services not performed on Reseda Medians improvement. Third Street, streetscape, streetscape improvement, and phase two of the Alameda buffer projects. Stranger. I move that we approve it. I don't have questions. Congrats, any questions on this? Sorry to keep you so long. I just thought that there you know, might be some concerns about this. But I, I have not been very happy with it. 
Sorry. I have no questions. Oh, okay. Very good. Well, thank you very much. It'll be the action of the committee to uh, approve the okay. refund then. All right. There being no other business before us, the meeting is adjourned.